we're learning a lot during COVID, us um, non-medical experts. We're learning what a nebulizer is, so it vaporises medicine. It's believed to have spread COVID in hotel quarantine in Victoria. Yes, that's right. So anyone who is an asthmatic, particularly from uh, about 10, 20 years ago, will be familiar with a nebulizer. So it's a machine you put liquid into and the nebulizer turns it into, I guess, a mist or an aerosol that you inhale. But if you've ever seen anyone using a nebulizer, they're wearing the mask, mm. all this mist is going everywhere. So it is what we call an aerosol generating pr procedure, generating lots of aerosols, which is the last thing you want with COVID. Right. So, and just on that point, it, I understand, in, and even in a normal hospital setting, yeah. pre-COVID, it was considered such a dangerous spreader that it was only used in a negative pressure room, so a room where only air could go in. It, it beggars belief that one would be used in hotel quarantine. Now, maybe not according to guidelines, but you'd want to be really careful about these and quiz people and say, you don't have a nebulizer, do you? Yeah, so I think that'll be investigated, but you certainly don't want anyone with a nebulizer going to hotel quarantine. You certainly don't want them using it. And the other thing... If they are using it, does that mean they are sick and perhaps should have gone to another facility? And this, uh, historically, in fact, the reason we don't use nebulizers goes back to the COVID coronavirus precursor, SARS, because in Hong Kong and China, when SARS first appeared, a lot of healthcare workers died, got sick and died, and they worked out it was because they were giving right. patients nebulizers. So that was, what, 15 years ago or so, and they sort of phased that all across the... Yeah, I don't know if every place, but a lot of places in Australia don't use nebulizers. So quarantine is needed in some form. We need to get Australians back here and we're hoping foreign students, all sorts of other people. In terms of the shutdowns still happening and breakouts, though, what changes would you make right now if, if you were in charge? Right. So I would like to see facilities, now that we're seeing so many uh, incursions, I guess, in hotel quarantine... I'd like to see some facilities on the outskirts of cities, so not in the highly populated, highly dense areas. So if something does happen, it doesn't spread to lots of people. So uh, you're talking about an outer suburb, because people say you have to go regional. Something in between that could be the outer suburb of Melbourne or Sydney, still get close to a hospital, still have workers nearby, exactly. but you don't have very high-density populations. Exactly. And I, look, the Howard Springs facility in the Northern Territory, it's about 25 kilometres south of Darwin, is, is pretty good. It also allows those poor people in hotel quarantine to get outside, which, uh, you don't miss, which is a luxury they can't afford in hotel quarantine in the cities at the moment. Mm. But, of course, we're treating... That's not going to happen immediately. So what do we do right now? We need to make sure that... Uh, people in hotel quarantine, the staff, are treated a bit like hospital workers. And if we're worried about aerosols, then maybe using these N95 masks. But if you are going to use them, it's not just here's an N95 mask, wear it. In hospitals, what we have to do now is fit test for them to make sure you're wearing the right N95 mask and you know that you've got a proper seal. So there's going to be a bit of training. Mm. It's also going to deplete the supply of N95 masks, but that's important. And also some sort of eye covering as well. So there are aerosols they don't get into the eyes. Regional facilities, and obviously there are logistics around um, the right facility, having individual toilets and so on, but what about proximity to a, a hospital and the size of hospital? I mean, do you just need proximity to an airport? Is it right that people don't tend to, unless they're in risk groups, fall really ill from COVID? Within a couple of hours, you can identify someone a day or two out and get them closer to a hospital. Look, that, that is a possibility, but it, it's not a, a certainty. Right. And... Uh, I believe, from what I've read in the, the media, this individual who is using the nebulizer is uh, extremely sick at the moment. So I think it's uh, very good that they were near a, a good healthcare facility. But with that person, you'd never put them, ideally, in this situation well, at all. Well, that's right, that's right. Right. Um, now, yesterday you spoke at the National Press Club. There was an audible gasp, I think, when you were talking about six years until yeah. the world is protected. What does that mean the world protected? Are we talking about global herd immunity, essentially? Yeah, so if we're looking at 75% of coverage of our local populations and our global populations with two doses of vaccine, we are at the moment 6.5 years away from that. Now, that is not set in stone. That is right now when we're having about just under 5 million people vaccinated per day worldwide. So... I calculated if we get that up to, say, 25 million, it will take about 
15 months to get the world to that level, which is a much nicer number than six and a half right. years. But that is going to be challenging. And you've got to keep updating it. It's not we're done in Australia this year, set and forget either. Yeah. No, no, exactly. As new mutations are appearing... Like the flu vaccine. Yeah, the vaccine manufacturers mm. are going to have to update the vaccine. We'll have to get boosters. So it's, it's going to be a challenge, Tom. Uh, we've heard state premiers say all through the crisis, we're just following health advice. Um, but this is even as they're making different decisions, different decisions on borders, on lockdowns. Does this highlight that health advice is never just do this, shut the border, but it's here are some options, here are the risks? Look, I suspect so. I suspect it is a conversation where the health authorities are largely being listened to. I think it's a completely different situation to the United States, but for whatever reason, each state and territory is doing things differently. Now, part of it, of course, is, for example, with quarantine, that normally is uh, under a federal mandate, but that was devolved to the states and territories, and not surprisingly, when you've got uh, a number of states and territories, they're mm. each going to do things slightly differently. But do, do you pause or any of your colleagues pause when you hear a state premier say their entire answer to something around, as I said, you know, two square metres, four square metres, all these different rules and all these different rules that are brought in, well, it's the health advice. That it's, it's never quite that simple. There's advice yeah. and then there are politicians deciding what to do with the advice. Yeah, no, no, that's right. And, look, to be fair, that probably is the advice they're following, but it would also be nice to get the person who gave that health advice to perhaps explain it in greater detail. And, of course, uh, chief health officers, chief medical officers are a regular presence at all the press conferences mm. where uh, the, the premiers, state um, uh, chief ministers and prime ministers are speaking. Mm. Yeah, and I'm not saying don't take the advice, obviously, but it's about knowing here was the advice, here's the detail, here's yeah. why, and then populations might be more willing to follow it then. No, no, that's right. And each state and territory, they've got a different uh, demographic in terms of age, level of education... Mm. Yeah. Uh, capability of contact tracing, and, of course, each outbreak is slightly different. So all those factors will come into it. St. Joe Senanaika, um, you are one of the voices being listened to at the time. We appreciate your opinion today. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.